Good afternoon. It's Bourbon Blog Live. I'm Tom Fisher here with my good friend, a food and beverage expert, and quite a, an amazing mixologist, Anthony Caparelli, joining us live from New York. How's it going, Anthony? Good, Tom. Good to be here, man. How you doing? It, hey, it's it's. I'm doing great. It's great to have you. And you and I, I know, have always been a big fan of Negronis. And I'm going to go ahead and put this link for people to follow along or if they see it later. Uh, these are the recipes Anthony is going to be making for us today and a chance for you to uh, hop on and purchase one of these spirits in case you want to celebrate Negroni Week. What is Negroni Week, Anthony? Uh, so Negroni Week is just our industry celebration of this amazing drink that's uh, been around since, um, you know, probably around 1919. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's a classic. It's one of the classics that's uh, experienced a renaissance in the last five to 10 years. Um, and, you know, I personally love it because folks that sort of follow uh, my approach to bartending, I like to think of recipes more as templates for, um, you know, for beverage chef chefs to just start with and then springboard from. Um, and this is an amazing template. It's got all the things that make a recipe work. Uh, it's great for drinking, but it's just as good for learning and sort of analyzing. Uh, so just a terrific week and a terrific initiative in our industry. Absolutely. And uh, Campari is doing some great work. I see they're raising some funds here. Uh, I can put this website up in a moment too, but people can su support restaurant workers, bartenders who are devastated by COVID. Uh, they're raising money this week, so they're doing some great things online, and we're helping support that by making Negroni cocktails. What is it about a Negroni cocktail that makes it something uh, special? I mean, it's it's easy to make, but it's also just really refreshing and can pair well with so many things. Yeah. So. Um so the Negroni is, is one of my favorite cocktails to look at the history of, um, because the Negroni as it exists today, most people are familiar with. So, so as you said, one, really, really easy to make. It's just gin. Well, you got to start with Campari, right, uh, which is an Amaro. So that's a, a bitter liqueur. Uh, European Campari is from Italy, uh, but a bitter liqueur. Uh, and then um, sweet vermouth and gin, equal parts stirred and served with an, usually an orange peel as the garnish. So really, really easy to make. But when you look at those three recipes, um, there's so much going on from a historical perspective. First of all, those, those recipes um, make sort of um, my canonical definition of a cocktail, and I certainly didn't make this up, um, but a spirit that is sweetened and flavored as opposed to just something mixed with alcohol. Uh, right. Vodka soda, for example, not really a cocktail, just a mixed drink. So when you look at that, that recipe, you have the gin, uh, you have the Campari and the sweet vermouth, all of those things are happening. You have the base spirit, the sweetener, and lots of flavoring going on. So it's, it's just really beautiful as an example of a cocktail. Um, but the interesting thing I think that, that a lot of people aren't aware of is that the Negroni actually evolved from an earlier drink called an Americano, which uh, cocktail aficionado, aficionados know uh, is a, 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 cocktail, a cocktail, but um, we all, most people I think know it as a coffee drink, uh, a no. shot of espresso, yeah, right, with, with a bunch of, of hot water. Um, yeah. but, but the cocktail started um, by, as a matter of fact, it was created by the, the gentleman who created Campari. Um, and it was probably around 1860. And what he did was take Campari and add sweet vermouth to it and then lighten it up with some soda water. And it's still one of my favorite go-to afternoon drinks. It's got a lemon peel garnish. Um, I, I love drinking in the afternoon. It's a low alcohol cocktail. But what I think is so interesting about that is I've been getting asked a lot about low ABV cocktails. I think you and I even talked about that yeah. um, because that's that's like one of the hot new trends. And I always tell people when it might, you know, I start my intro to that whole low ABV, low alcohol cocktail thing is it's not a new trend. It's the old way of drinking. The high alcohol cocktails are the new trend and nothing illustrates that better than the story of the Negroni because, um, Count Negroni in about 1919, the Americano was his favorite drink and he went into his uh, his favorite bar in Florence uh, and asked the bartender to strengthen it up a little bit by replacing the soda water with gin. And turn turned what was, yeah, turned what was a traditional low alcohol cocktail that had been enjoyed for 
you know, 50 years into a more modern high alcohol cocktail, the Negroni, uh, which is actually the newer <laughs> of those two drinks. So that whole story to me is just is, is fantastic. I think that it is really cool. It puts things into perspective. And I, I always tell people that, you know, one of the things that I try and do when I when I uh, do education uh, outreach, especially with consumers, is, you know, we, we need to stop focusing so much on just the buzz and the shots and the beer bombs and the keg stands and this kind of thing and the alcohol as an intoxicant. Um, these drinks or drinks in general, we've been enjoying them for centuries and we've been enjoying them as a cuisine for the flavor, for the experience, uh, for the history, for the culture, for the, the company, right? You and I talk about that all the time, uh, the conviviality of it. And and the, this story, sort of Negroni story, I think to me just, just is a perfect example of that. Um, it's got the history, it's got the evolution. Uh, and then when you look at those three ingredients, like I said, you know, we're gonna play with them and, and use them, as I said, as a springboard, because you can take those three ingredients and start substituting. And that opens up a whole new world. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's such a special drink, and it's inspired so many other great cocktails. And again, if you're watching this live, please like this video, share it. We're excited about uh, celebrating Negroni Week with you. And again, the, the drinks, if it was 1919, what? It's a little over 100 years old. Yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly. That, 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 I'm curious to see how many drinks that are current fads are still around at 100 years. Exactly. Um, Oh yeah, you know, and, and and where people, I was thinking about this this morning. You know, um, Count Negroni. Nobody knows what Count Negroni did. He was a big deal back in the day, uh, but he's most famous now, 100 years later, for creating a cocktail. Uh, I could live with that. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Very nice. Well, uh, I'll go ahead and have you um, go. Ahead. Let's. You want to? You want to make the Negroni for us? Yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely. Let's go ahead yeah. and get started. So, like I said, I'll start with a classic Negroni. Yeah, because sure. it's, it's a, you know, it's a great place to start, um, and then we can talk about things you can do with the Negroni. And you know, Negroni week, <laughs> you got a week, so have fun with it. Um, you got a but week. I'm going to do just a really, really classic Negroni, equal parts one ounce gin, Campari, sweet vermouth. Uh, so I have a, a, a mixing glass about halfway full of ice. And this drink is traditionally stirred, um, and I'm going to free pour. One day we need to we need to do a thing on free pouring because that's my preferred way of measuring. Um, it's a little quicker. Uh, I think last time I was with you, I did jiggers, but I'm going to do one ounce of Campari to get us started, and then one ounce of gin. And you have all of these recipes. And the nice thing uh, about oh, I got a little bit of a little bit of a speed pour issue here. Um, the nice thing about this drink is even without substituting the spirits, in other words, you don't need to substitute gin, you can substitute the type of gin and it's going to right. change the drink because gin has lots of different, all the different gins have different character. Um, and then one ounce of sweet vermouth. Now I am using um, a really special sweet vermouth. This is Method Spirits. I don't even think you can get this yet. Um, this is made some good by some good friends of mine. It's one of their new craft local vermouths so check oh, cool. out method spirits yeah dot com. Made it, uh, where's that made them right here in new york new right, york wine. Right here in new york very nice. very nice yeah man check it out method spirits it's gonna it's great uh, they got a kickstarter campaign they did really well okay so uh equal parts gin sweet vermouth campari and then i'm gonna stir 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 stir, stir. stir and really really important and folks probably get tired of hearing me say this but the ice melt is an ingredient it doesn't water down the drink it opens it up it keeps it from to burning open. yeah and again you got to remember this drink started without the gin in it this was uh, just sweet vermouth campari and soda water so right. believe me, this is not going to hurt this drink. It's going to open it up. It's going to make it better. So I say about 30 seconds. Uh, you'll get a feel for it. You should see the liquid level rise. Uh, and then because I'm pouring out of our mixing glass, I use a julep strainer. And that just goes in dome side up. You just push it down real gently. You'll feel it lock. And then you can pin it up against the glass just like that and pour it into a rocks glass over Oh, Fresh man. ice, Excellent. how do you like that? Oh, yeah. yeah, good. So that's, uh, for those of you who doubt free pouring, that you can see that that works. Uh, and then an orange peel, I like a nice big one. Uh, and orange side out, that's where all the zest is, the oils. Two thumbs on the bottom, index and middle fingers on top. And I'm going to pop this right down over the drink. I'm going to try and do it in the air and see if, see if the camera picks up any of those oils. A we'll little see. bit of oil there. You get, just you get it, it removes that oil. I think, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you can see that that's what you want down there on the drink. So I'm going to pop it again a couple times. And then again, orange side out, just on the rim and slide it down in. And it can't be simpler than that uh, beautiful, classic Negroni. Cheers. Cool? Great. Yeah, cheers. cheers. Uh, and and the, the, yeah, the aroma. So not only, you know, the orange peel obviously is aromatic, but the, all three of these uh, spirits are, are aromatic. And so right. the nose coming off of this is just amazing. Uh, another reason to really go ahead and open that up so you don't just get alcohol burn on your nose. You want it to be able to be carried to the nose and, and uh, really enjoy it. So that's it. I'm going to take a little sip if you don't Yeah, mind. please do. And they all have all these three ingredients <sighs> have so much power and, and aroma that you really do need equal proportions on those. It's not There are not many cocktails that are just three ingredients, equal proportions, are there? No, no. I mean, you know, I, I like to tell people don't get too precious mm -hmm. with ingredients and what with recipes rather with quantities. Right. You know, it's I, I always take everything back to the kitchen and I say, you know, when you give a chef a recipe, they're going to put the amount in that's right for them. And it's going to vary based on the ingredients. Sometimes the strength of different ingredients varies with batches. It's going to be based on their presentation, their style. Um, so don't get too hung up with proportions. Make the drink the way you like it. Um, but this equal parts is a great way to start. Again, they all are all very botanical spirits, lots of aromatics, lots of plants going on in here. And, you know, really the genius of, of uh, Count Negroni's addition of gin or use of gin mm -hmm. is that these as i said are two very botanical spirits they're uh they're you know they're all very plant-based um and they uh lots of aromatics going on things like that gin is the perfect spirit to add to that if he you know if he'd gone with vodka if they were even drinking that in italy then uh it just would have added alcohol um whiskey would have changed the the, the flavor of the drink and we're gonna we're gonna do that later uh but gin is really the, the perfect thing to add uh, to these two spirits. So yeah, to your point, easy, simple, um, modify it, go, go ahead and, and, you know, change it, hop it up, personalize it, whatever you want to do, but start with this and see what you think. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Great, great cocktail. Any questions for uh, Anthony Cavarelli or myself, please ask them down below. And yeah, I see yeah. some people already liking and sharing this video and fun to hear about uh, riffs on Negronis. I mean, there are some interesting riffs on Negronis I've seen uh, from warm Negronis to uh, what kind of riffs have you seen that you've, uh, that you've appreciated? So again, the, the, what I like to do when I'm, you know, especially if I'm teaching bartenders or, uh, you know, even, even consumers, what right. I like to do is analyze those, those three spirits. So, so we have gin, right? That's our base spirit. So first of all, you can substitute different gins. And if you do this drink with say Hendrix, that's got uh, prominent rose and cucumber, that's gonna be completely different from a Plymouth that I'm using. Uh, yeah. If you do it with um, you know, Bulldog, every gin brings their own particular character to yeah. the drink. So, so that's one. You can also change the vermouth because vermouth also, all of them very, very unique. The method brings its own character. They use some botanicals that, are, that they're the only ones that use, uh, that, that use those. Um, lots of vermouths use local botanicals and when I say botanicals I think most people think I, I think they know what I mean is you know plant extracts um, so making this with a different vermouth is going to be a very different uh, drink and then believe it or not you can substitute and this isn't heresy the Campari because the Campari is an Amaro uh, it's, it's a, a bitter liqueur and they're made all over Italy and France I love Amaros, and when I go to Italy, I like going to each little town and tasting their own Amaros because they're all made with very local ingredients in, in very uh, unique ways. So you can substitute. Uh, um, you can change the drink, but you can also change the spirit categories, which is what we're going to do next. Right. My favorite riff on this is called the Boulevardier. And that was created in Paris by an American uh, journalist who, who founded a magazine by that name in Paris uh, right around 19, late 1920s. Uh, and that's the same drink except for the gin. And he did use whiskey. And it completely changes the drink. So Count Negroni probably wouldn't have recognized it. I absolutely love it. And what you end up with, and see if anyone picks up on this, uh, you know, I'll put it out here first, but you have bourbon. You have sweet vermouth. Right. So where am I going with this drink? 
It looks like another familiar drink that we know about, it, right? We're right. From Manhattan, yes. It's a Manhattan, right? And then and then the Campari just bitters that up. And what do you what do you garnish a Manhattan with? Cocktail bitters. Right. So again, when you start looking and you start breaking these drinks down, you can see that you know what works works for a reason. And so I always tell bar new bartenders that are trying to create that next great drink. Start with a with, a, with an existing drink that works. One of my, you know, I, I say this all the time. The best way to create a great new drink is to start with a great old drink and change one thing. And change and it that, up. Change one thing, yeah, and see how that works. So all we're doing here is this is a Manhattan, and instead of using cocktail bitters, we're putting the bitters, the Amaro Spirit, right in the drink. Okay, in there, and, a little bit more of it, but less intense. With that. Exactly, exactly. So so you know you got something that's probably going to work. So let's go ahead and make that. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and, and just freshen up my ice. Uh, yeah, the, a little, the, little, the, little bit here. Something we're seeing more and more at, uh, well, when we can go to them, whiskey festivals, whiskey events. I know there's a lot of bartenders that, um, as they're showcasing a spirit, uh, whether it's Tales or another event, love to do a Boulevardier. Because the whiskey really does showcase itself very nicely. It's it's perfect. We drink it all the time. We we drink whiskey and sweet vermouth with bitters all the time, right? right? So so it, it's a perfect way to showcase the whiskey. And if you think changing up the gin in a Negroni will give you variety, try changing up the whiskey in a Boulevardier. Doing this with Maker's Mark is sort of my go-to. Everyone probably knows by now. I'm a huge Maker's Mark fan. I think it's a very accessible spirit. They make it really well. Uh, the price point is great. I, I don't it's you know, cocktails too. It just goes right. It's yeah. just great. But if you do this drink with a smoky scotch, like an Isla scotch, let's mm -hmm. say a Bowmore or something like that, it's going to be a completely different drink. If you do it with rye, that's actually even closer to a classic Manhattan. That's what the original Manhattan was. Um, so you can really, really get a lot of variety by changing the whiskey. And if you want to keep it closer to a traditional Manhattan, you can just use a little bit less of the sweet vermouth and the Campari and kick the whiskey up and you'll just have something that's sort of in between a Manhattan and a Boulevardier. And again, it's going to give you a great drink and you'll be able to kind of play with it and make it your own. Make sense? Absolutely. All right. So, like I said, mixing glass, ice, um, you know, don't don't sweat the little residue in the bottom. It's 99% the same thing uh, as that we were just mixing with. And I'm going to start with an ounce of my Maker's Mark. And I am just not having good luck with my spouts today. I'm sorry about that. Uh, and again, I'm going to do an ounce of my Method Spirit Sweet Vermouth. And I'm going to do an ounce of my Campari. Do a little musical chairs with this. <laughs> there we go. Get it done, right? And stir, 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 stir. Same thing, about 30 seconds. If you are uh, if you don't do this for 12 hours a day, uh, just go ahead and, uh, you know, you really want to get that ice. You notice I put fresh ice in there. You want that ice nice and cold. The ice temperature will go up right. as you use it. Um, so, you know, for those who are interested, you know, the, I use the, the back of the mixing spoon. When I'm stirring, right. it tends to not get caught up in the ice as much. Just so you need to keep both ends clean. And just stir, stir, stir. Just real, a little bit of wrist movement here. And then, again, fresh ice and my julep strainer. And I'm going to strain that right into that cocktail glass. Now we have what was once a gin co gin cocktail, oh, now is a whiskey cocktail. Is now a whiskey cocktail. Same thing, mm -hmm. thumbs on the bottom, index middle finger, somebody right over the drink. A couple times, just get those oils nice in there, orange side out always around the rim of the glass and slide it down. And that is my Boulevardier. So right. cheers for Negroni week and a little variation there. Ah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you just, <laughs> I mean, yeah, right? You could do bourbon. You could do scotch. You could do pick another kind of whiskey. This could become another another element of the Boulevardier. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Italian spirits. I mean, you know, uh, being Italian yourself, the last ten or fifteen years or so, we've seen a growth of Italian spirit interest in those, right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, again, Europe has such a rich tradition of of making beautiful, beautiful spirits because that recipe. For the uh, for the cocktail, spirit sweetener and some sort of flavoring ingredient uh, is what was the basis. 
for a lot of these liqueurs and even the fortified wines and things like vermouth. Uh, so when you look at how folks drank spirits before we had modern cocktail bars, and especially before we had modern American cocktail bars, you would go into the local public house, you would go into you know whoever had a bottle of spirits and was was serving it to people they took the local alcohol that was distilled from whatever the waste products they could get their hands on uh and then they would flavor it with local ingredients and then they would sweeten it and and then they would bottle it and that's how you drank it you know there were no modern bartenders certainly you know most folks again that are that kind of study this thing you look at professor jerry thomas 1860s to 1880s publishing sort of the first modern cocktail book well, what was going on in 1745 when Drambuie was invented? What was going on in 1790? This, they were they were putting the spirit in a bottle, they were sweetening it, they were flavoring it, and they were consuming it. It's really just a ready-made cocktail. So we're just, we're to your point, we're rediscovering all that now. We're right. going into all these little towns and villages across Europe that have been making these spirits uh, for generations. And now they're accessible because of the internet, because of the advances in shipping, and mostly because of the interest in the marketplace. Um, but we do it right here in America, Tom. Anyone who's ever had a bottle of Southern Comfort, that's what that is. I mean, that was, yeah. you know, it was originally bourbon with, you know, peach and sugar. And right. because that's that's that how cool. we drank spirits, right? Right. So you, you didn't have, uh, you know, a, a world famous cocktail, but you didn't have a dead rabbit or an employees only or a death and company, you know, back in the day. You, you went to whoever the local moonshiner was, whoever the local distiller was, and they poured you a spirit that they'd already put in the bottle. It was sweetened, it was flavored, it was their liqueur. Uh, and that's where these things came from. And I just love that we're rediscovering them and that there's now a market for them, like, like never before in history. And we're diving into them more and more, especially I think right now, the last six months as people are wanting to discover new things. Maybe the Negroni is new to you if you're watching, or maybe you're discovering a new Italian spirit. But I love the discovery that's happening uh, within people's homes. And as they get back to bars, the, the, new, uh, the new creations that people have come up with uh, during this time as well. Yeah, and that's one of the things, again, that I love about uh, not only this recipe, but sort of digging into it and analyzing yeah. it, because I think people are mixing at home more than ever before. That trend was happening even, you know, back before the shutdown. Uh, but I think it's certainly gone up. And being able to sort of understand the role that these ingredients play allows you to start really uh, getting the most mileage out of your liquor cabinet. Because if you have to buy a bottle now from you know the liquor store or drizzly to make one drink well what are you going to do with the rest of the bottle so knowing how you can utilize the ingredients is more important than ever um and i think again it, it helps turn the average consumer into more of a bar chef so knowing how to use chicken in a recipe to me is much more important than knowing a recipe that uses chicken Right. Does that make sense, right? Yes. And again, if people are watching, they can go right to this link down below, save the recipes, try them at home tonight or this week. And you can even order from those links right there on that, that link uh, from Drizzly. Get all the ingredients sent to you. Celebrate Negroni Week uh, right there at home and uh, check out that link. Also, do check out NegroniWeek.com. There's an area where you can donate to bartenders and bar, uh, restaurant employees people that are really hurting right now during COVID. What's it been like? I know things have, uh, maybe since we last talked, uh, what are things like for restaurants and bars right now in New York, Anthony? You know, New York is sort of, I've been saying New York has sort of been like the crucible um, of this and please no disrespect uh, to any areas that's that's been hit hard. I know there are a lot of areas that have been hit very, very hard, uh, but certainly the media has been focused on New York um, and, you know, there's there's been some significant impact here. Um, so, you know, I think New York was hit early. So on the one hand, we may be a little bit ahead on trying the recovery, um, but it's, it's, we're getting mixed results. You know, the outdoor dining has been going on for a while. I've been uh, going out as much as I can to support the, the bars and restaurants. Uh, it's a little deceiving. And I think people need to be aware of this. If your area is doing a lot of outdoor dining, one of the things that I do is, uh, you know, as a, as a restaurant uh, instructor and consultant, I go right up to the maitre d or the manager and I ask them, you know, it looks like you're pretty full. You're on a wait. Every, all the tables outside are, are full. 
um, what is your actual business like? And I have yet to I have yet to have somebody come back and say that it's any more than twenty five percent of what it was when they were open. Yeah. Um, so you know, again, it's a little deceiving. So so it is still a struggle with the outdoor dining. It's getting cold. You know, summer's about to end, and we're really interested to see what happens with that. Uh, we were recently allowed to open at 25% indoor capacity here in New York, uh, and folks are, you know, I think going to give that uh, as good a shot as they can, uh, right. and I'm sure they're going to do a great job with it. But that's a tough number to run a restaurant at, yeah, especially, you know. Yeah, most restaurants run at about 5% profit margin. Um, you know, 5 to 10 is what we like to pray for. Um, but if you're running at 5% and you cut your sales volume from 100% to 25%, you you just can't operate on, on 5% of that 25%. You just can't. And, and you don't even end up with 5% of the 25% because all your fixed costs, things like rent, uh, insurance, marketing, all that stuff doesn't change. So what's happening is that most restaurants are just seeing their profits go away completely and then their business scale down. And I think they're just kind of in treading water mode. So long story short, please support your bars and restaurants. Right. If they're doing, you know, takeout, support them. If they are doing dine-in or outdoor dining, um, you know, do support them within your comfort level and, you know, within your ability to do it safely um, because it is going to be tough and it's going to be a long road to recovery. The other thing that you and I have talked about, you know, I spend sort of equal time in the theater world. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I always tell people we're, we're in an ecosystem here. It's, it's a, an economic ecosystem. And if you want to see things like theater come back, Restaurants have to come back and vice versa right. because they support each other. Hotels have to come back. Airlines have to come back. So, you know, even if you aren't particularly vested in the restaurant industry and you don't eat out a lot, but you're a theater fan and you like to travel, you got to get the restaurants back up. And it's it's true for all of those verticals. They all, they all they're all interconnected, aren't they? they especially all, absolutely in city, but especially someplace like New York where where hospitality, where tourism, where all these things where entertainment is is so important. Uh, one of the cool things, let's be sure we mentioned that you're doing, and again, the, the website, VTF Live, is the virtual theater live? VTF.live, yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, down there. Uh, you're doing a virtual theater uh, festival with Playbill to help get the theater, uh, the actors, the people involved to perform a virtual theater festival online. Yeah, so, you know, again, trying to help the industry come back in some way. Um, Live online is is a great way to uh, to experience entertainment. I think people just understand that uh, it was it was growing before the shutdown. I think it's going to continue. It's certainly growing through the shutdown. I don't think it's going away. So uh, I I started very early on. I think in in March uh, exploring how we could start utilizing live online performances as a way to present and produce theater. Because to me, the thing that sets theater apart from all the other art forms is that live aspect of it. It's the fact that the audience, two things, the audience experiences the performance in real time with the performer as it's happening. And as importantly, they experience the performance in real time with each other. So wow. that to me, those two elements is really what sets theater apart. Now, ideally they're all in the same room, but we can't always do that. But that to me is what really sets theater apart from video, from web, from film. So, and it's hard, it's, it's really, really difficult to do. Um, so I started experimenting with that with my company early on and you know we were lucky enough to partner with Playbill and, and get VTF Live going. Uh, we have 12 amazing productions. It's gonna air on October 23rd and 24th. Uh, you can go to VTF Live and purchase tickets. They're only $2.99 wow. and it gets you Two day, you know, two two hour broadcasts of theater plus the award ceremony. We are going to have a panel of judges pick a winner, and then you, the audience, is also going to pick an audience choice winner, and they each win fifteen hundred dollars. Um, and then you'll be able to watch those performances uh, on the site afterwards. But we're really, really excited about that, and and. You know, as importantly, we were also able to partner with the Actors Fund, which is an amazing charity supporting actors. Uh, and it's it's been around forever. They're one of the most well-respected 
theater charities, and we're donating a dollar, full 30% of each ticket sale, um, to directly to the Actors Fund. So, you know, please check that out, and uh, and and hopefully we'll, you know, we'll be able to figure out a way to, uh, you know, the, the slogan for the for the festival is start making theater again, uh, and that's really what we're looking at doing is is give performers and theater makers and producers uh, of all voices. Um, an opportunity to start making theater again. Got to yeah, and start making it again. Find a way. You found some really incredible ways, Anthony. Congratulations to you on the virtual theater festival for finding ways to help uh, those involved in theater and those of us who enjoy it. You know, uh, one of the last places I was before the pandemic, before the shutdown, was New York. I saw a Broadway show just three nights before it closed down, and uh, you know, I know it's affected so many people, but the fact that you're getting people back at it virtually is awesome. So well done on that, Anthony. And check out right there, vtf.live to learn more about it. And uh, always a, a real fun time with you, Anthony. I think this uh, this cocktail, again, it's I know it's one of your, our, your favorites, one of my favorites. Great as an aperitif, great along with food. I mean, it is it does complement Italian food, but it's it can complement a lot of things. I mean, I, that's what I love about this. Yeah, absolutely. Again, it's as versatile as it gets. It's got the bitter, um, it's got the, the spirit uh, and the flavoring. And, and, you know, the important thing, again, with that cocktail template, uh, it's, it, you know, when you dig into it, it's really not just the, the flavoring. It, it needs to be bitter or sour to complement, to, to balance the sweetness. And that's really what sets cocktails apart even more than, you know, what I was talking about earlier. So spirit, sweetener, and then either sour or bitter to balance the sweetness. And again, this has all of that. It's it's it right down to the of of the cocktail uh, and the history of the cocktail. Fa favorite Italian dish to uh, to have with a Negroni? Oh boy, uh, you know. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm a big fan of, of sort of sitting outside, uh, you know, in a cafe, uh, right. just in, enjoying the Negronis. Um, but if, if you're going to put me on the spot, I would have to say, uh, I'm, I'm going to go with, uh, probably like a linguine fra diablo or something like that. Uh, you know, some fresh, some homemade pasta um, yeah. with a red sauce that's got some heat to it. So this really will kind of tame that heat oh, and yeah. you get that sort of balance going on in your mouth. Um, and then, you know, again, all the flavors from the red sauce are going to stand up to this yeah. really, really well. Um, and it, it's just a, I've actually had, I've enjoyed that before. <laughs> uh, and it's just, it, it works really, really well. Nice spicy peppers against this. I can see how that would be just incredible. It's amazing, what a great yeah. pairing. I'll tell you another great pairing with the Negroni is working at home or maybe at the end of the day when you're done working at home. So that's why I go on to uh, bourbonblog.com forward slash Negroni. Find out how you can get some uh, all, all the ingredients delivered uh, right to your door and save that. Uh, book, bookmark that. Uh, try the recipes out at home and support uh, your local bartenders and restaurants for Negroni Week. Anthony, my friend, it's always a pleasure uh, hanging out with you and having a sip. And uh, thanks for a little midday Negroni. This was a good reason to have a good midday Negroni for us. Tom, thanks for inviting me on. As always, looking forward to the next time we share a drink together. Absolutely. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, Anthony.